So today I'm going to talk about web application of the future. And it's not really the future. I think it's more the not so near future actually today. Because we already heard people mentioning WebAssembly, which is actually the future, I think. But let's look at the very near future or today or tomorrow uh, with TypeScript and the GraphQL. So who is this talk actually for? So one thing to know when you're working with GraphQL or TypeScript is types. So when you're thinking about types, you might have some considerations. So one here can tell me what a date is. Because a date can be many things. Like an example, today is... Oh, I broke something. Ah, so today is a date. So it's December 7th, which is a date. But you also have those dried fruits that are also called dates. And then even if you use those dried fruits, you can make the word date, which actually also is a date. So this already gets really confusing. And then also you can talk about dates, and dates can look like this. So these are all examples of dates. And you also have dates in programming. So these are all things to keep in mind when you think about type system. What actually is a date? And if you don't have a type system, you can't really know what a date is, because you might need to do manual checking every time you update something. Or maybe when you're getting data in your application that could be a date, you're not sure that's actually a date. So that's something to keep in mind, and that's why I really like type systems. So a bit about myself. So I'm Roy. Uh, I'm from Amsterdam, and most of my time I spent working on open source projects for the city I'm living in, so the city of Amsterdam, where we create projects for the entire city and for people that work for the city uh, to make the world in the city a bit better. And also I teach React and GraphQL at the React GraphQL Academy, and I work with some other companies as well. And basically all the technologies I use are either JavaScript or TypeScript, GraphQL, and sorry for the people that spoke about Vue, I like React better. <laughs> That's great. So, Woon here already knows TypeScript. And Woon here already used TypeScript. So, that's way less people, okay. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about TypeScript this, so you got some perspective and you know what I'm actually talking about. So, TypeScript is called what is a typed superset of JavaScript. And if you ask this to the internet, it will say it contains all the features of a given language, and it has expanded or enhanced those given futures. So meaning you would have extra futures in TypeScript, or maybe there is some syntactic sugar over stuff. And also it compiles to plain JavaScript, because your browser can't read TypeScript, it needs some readable format, and for that it will be compiled to something that's readable for the browser. In this case, on the left you can see TypeScript, you can see there are types defined for, for the function, for its return, or for its input, and on the right side you can see the actual output of what TypeScript will compile for you. So that's readable by the browser, so it will work hopefully on every machine. And also it uses the latest ECMAScript future. So it basically means it holds itself to the same convention as most JavaScript uh, futures do, which is ECMAScript. And this will basically mean, so this was a few months ago, that TypeScript recently turned 7. And it has already has new stuff like optional changing in there, which is kind of new in JavaScript as well. So it's really good to know that if you're using TypeScript, you basically can use all the functions you could do in JavaScript, but then they are enhanced or yeah, made better for you. So we already know TypeScript has types. We also know GraphQL has types as well, which makes it also really strong and easy to use. So who's already familiar with GraphQL in here? Okay, that's less people. Who's used GraphQL in here? Oh, so everyone that knows it used it. So that's, that's interesting. Okay, so let's look at GraphQL. So GraphQL is what they call a query language for APIs. So GraphQL helps you make APIs better readable, better understandable, and makes it easier to enhance, to use them in your products. And basically that will mean that what a GraphQL query would look like, you're not sending a single request to an endpoint and you get whatever data uh, there is available. Instead, you can define your queries and you can define what your data structure that's returned looks like and what data is in there. So if you look at this example, on the left you can see a query. So that's what I would be sending over HTTP to my GraphQL API, and I'm asking for a product with a certain ID, and I also ask for title, thumbnail, and price, and on the right side you can see it returns me some JSON, and this JSON is formatted in the same way as your query is formatted. So that way it's really easy to know what kind of data you're expecting, and what kind of data you can use in your UI. Yeah, so like I said before, you send a request to a single endpoint. 
But a single endpoint doesn't only return something from one data collection, which you would have in REST, actually. Uh, but it will return data from multiple resources or data collections or whatever you're actually asking for. So this would mean if you would send a query on the left, it's almost the same as the one I sent before. Instead, I'm also asking for offers. So why offers? I work a lot for categories, sorry. So why categories? Categories is a relationship with product, and this is information I want to use in my UI. And as you can see, I'm asking for categories, and categories could be an object or an array. That's something that's defined in your schema, which you'll see later on. And I'm asking for a title. So this title is information that is nested somewhere in the categories. And as you can see, it will return an array for me with the title information for every category. So this basically means with one single endpoint on one query, you can retrieve more information than just from a single REST endpoint, because you're getting more data than you would have from one data collection. And also, more, most importantly, it's based on the type system. So as we already saw, we have TypeScript, which is based on types, and we have GraphQL, which has a type system. And this type system will look a bit uh, like this, so basically the arrows looks like this. So what I'm trying to do here, I'm doing mutation, and mutation is if you want to mutate data. So in this case, I want to mutate data. I've got on the left side, on the top, you can see my mutation that I'm sending. Below, you can see all the variables, so my parameters that I want to send to it. And on the right, you can see an error. And this is because I'm not holding myself to the type system of GraphQL, so I'm actually breaking the rules, and that's why I get an error. So that's why a type system is important for GraphQL. You actually you force your users to use the types that you've defined in your schema. And those type systems from uh, TypeScript and GraphQL, they aren't too different and they can actually work together. So why aren't they too different? So on the left side, you can see a TypeScript type, but I could also put an interface there. It depends on your use case, but I chose for a type. On the right side, you can see one from GraphQL. And you can see they both have the same fields. So we've got ID, we've got title or whatsoever, and they both have relationships. And those relationships and fields look very much the same. As you can see, so they have scholar types, and scholar types are actually the basic types, the types that I haven't defined myself and that come with the language. So with TypeScript, there come some scholar types, and also with GraphQL, there will come some scholar types as well. So you're free to define your own types, but those types are in there automatically. And as you can see, they're almost the same. So for TypeScript, you can see I'm, as, I'm defining a field as a number, and in GraphQL, it will be an integer. And yeah, so you can also have a float if you have different kind of numbers. So these are rules to apply with. And you can also see we have relationships, and they're almost written the same. For um, categories in TypeScript, I've used this notation. There are different notations for arrays or objects in TypeScript as well, but I chose for this one because it looks the most like you, the one you can see on the right, which is for GraphQL. So as you can see, they both have a relationship with a category type, and category field will be um, an integral object, an array in this instance, of that category type, which you can see in the schema. And also, they have required or optional flags. So it's a bit different how it goes. Um, in TypeScript, we assume by default that something is required, unless you define it isn't. In GraphQL, it's the other way around. Uh, nothing is required unless you define it to be required. So you can see the exclamation mark and the question mark. So this is something to keep in mind when you try to work together with these technologies. So how can you actually combine those technologies? Because you can already assume if you need to type over your GraphQL schema or maybe you have to type over your TypeScript type every time, it's going to get really messy because you're working with two sources of truth. It's something you like to avoid because it's probably just going to lead to bugs at some place or maybe someone's making changes while you're not uh, looking what's actually happening. So you need to combine those to get the full efficiency. And for this, there's a great tool called GraphQL Code Generator. And this is made by a group of people that work with GraphQL a lot, and they've implemented this for, uh, for TypeScript, but also for uh, some other frameworks or libraries you can use together with TypeScript or GraphQL. And basically, you can define it best as a CLI tool that helps you generate TypeScript types from GraphQL schema. So whatever we'll be doing uh, with the GraphQL code generator, your GraphQL schema will be your source of truth. So whatever it's defined on your API or your backend, or how would you like to call it, that actually is a sort of truth. So your front-end application has nothing to do with what's actually going on in the backend. So that's why it's not really dependent on each other. And if you remember both the type definitions, with the GraphQL code generator, you can create TypeScript types from GraphQL schemas, which kind of look like this, because we've got the types. As you can see, they're 
they're really, they're really the, very much the same, but there are some small differences. And the GraphQL schema is used to create the GraphQL the TypeScript types, which you saw on the left. It basically means that the generation will work like this. And as you can expect, on the right side you can see your GraphQL schema, on the left side you can see your TypeScript types. There are some similarities in between, and as you can see, um, there's a mapping of the scholar types with the basic types from TypeScript, which you can see over here. So that's where you will always know your scholar types and your basic types, they will be in sync because they're mapped to each other, and nothing on that will change probably. And then you can also see your, uh, your own types that you define. So product in this case is a type I've defined myself, and instead of saying it's an in integer, it's mapped to the scholar type integer in TypeScript. So this way there will be, there always will be a similarity between those two, um, either type declarations in TypeScript and type declarations in your GraphQL schema. And you can also see the relationships are still there. So how does this actually work? So like I told before, this is done with the GraphQL code generator, and it's something you can install from NPM. So if you would run these commands like GraphQL and it GraphQL code gen CLI, you are able to run a wizard to set up this in your application. So meaning you would need a GraphQL API, otherwise it wouldn't work at all. And then you would need the TypeScript front-end application or also a back-end application, which is possible as well. And you can run the wizard and you can set up your application to work with your GraphQL schema. Or you're free to define your own uh, settings. So maybe you have a more advanced setting, maybe it's really complex, maybe you want to define other things that aren't available in a wizard. You're able to run it yourself, create a code gen GEML file, and define everything you'd like to do in here. So it opens the door to end-to-end -end type safety, which I will show you in a small, in a small demo, if we can get this working. So on one side I would have a GraphQL server, and basically the code for that looks like this. So this is our code for a GraphQL server, which is basically the schema. As you can see here, I've got my types defined, I've got a product, I've got information for this product, and it's something I'd like to show in my UI. And if you aren't familiar with GraphQL, uh, basically how a GraphQL server would work is something like this. So you would have your query, and in your query you define what information you'd like to receive, and then your GraphQL server will return that information. And basically, like I told you before, you're able to control whatever data will be returned by the server. So if I would somehow choose not to get this block, so I can delete this block, so I no longer want to return it back, then it's deleted from your output as well. And this is all just by one single endpoint over HTTP. So if we want to have this work together with TypeScript, there are some things we needed to do, right? So I've created a TypeScript application for you already. And this is an application where I'm not working together with Code Generator. So basically what I've done here, I've defined an interface for everything that's going on um, on my GraphQL schema. So as you can see, I've got an interface for product, I've defined ID as a string, title as a string, I've defined a relationship, I've even defined types for the relationships inside my other type. And as you can imagine, if you're expanding your schema, if someone is making changes, this gets very messy because now my output's working, but let's just assume I'm changing something in my GraphQL server. What would happen then? Because I've got the code for that running here. So suppose I'm changing something with, maybe with offer. Maybe I'm no longer want to return a reseller. Maybe I want to choose to return a reseller name. And I've already did all the other changes for this. So this would work and this would return me a reseller name instead of reseller, which you can actually see right here. So I'm going to get the offer information again. And instead of reseller, we get reseller name. So as you can see, my GraphQL server is returning data for a reseller name. But my application is still looking at reseller. So as you can imagine, this crashes because reseller name isn't there anymore. So whenever I make changes to my GraphQL schema, nothing happens in my TypeScript application, which is going to lead to bugs like this, especially when people go away over the weekends, they push stuff to production, and everything will... Uh, will break down. So let's put reseller back in there just to have my code working again. Yeah, so now I should be able to run my code again. If I would go here. Yeah, you can see everything's back to normal. 
But like I told you before, I don't want to uh, define my types uh, manually in my TypeScript application. So that's where the GraphQL code generator steps in. So first we need to actually install it, which can be done from NPM. Just by installing GraphQL and GraphQL code gen, we can add this to our application. Enhance this a bit. So this is gonna take some time to actually install um, those packages in my application. Yeah, so now my uh, now everything is installed like I would expect it to, and I've installed the GraphQL code generator as well. So now I'm actually able to run the command for GraphQL code gen, which looks like this. Oh, it doesn't look like this. I need to initiate it, of course. So now I'm able to choose what I would like to do. So am I creating a backend? Am I creating a frontend with maybe Angular or React or whatever is mentioned in here? So I choose to go with React because that's what my application looks like. So the next thing it's gonna ask me is, where is my schema defined? Is it locally? Maybe it's in, an, in a, in a remote server. So my schema is actually in a remote server. So let me get the URL for this because I also have it in here. So it's this URL. So let me copy it. So now I'm gonna define in a wizard where a graphical code generator can find my GraphQL server to actually get the schema from there. So let's define this. It also asks me where my operations and fragments can be found. So operations are a query, an example, or a mutation. And I have to find those in a .graphql file. So I'm just gonna enter with this. It's gonna assume I want some um, extra libraries installed, which are already in here. So I can just go on with there. And then it's gonna ask me where to write the output. So the output will be a generated file with all my types uh, in TypeScript as defined in my GraphQL schema. And then it's gonna ask me for an introspection file. I don't really need it, but let's just continue. And what script and package.json should run the code gen? So something that it will do, it will add a new script to your package.json to actually run uh, the introspection query to the GraphQL server and generate the types for you. So let's call it generate, as that's what you're actually doing. And now it's gonna say, you've installed everything and now you need to run npm install or yarn again. And then you can run the generator. So let's try yarn. And now actually this, because I'm working with the latest version of Create React App, I'm gonna need to install some alpha things as well. So if you're working with an older application, then you should be fine and you don't have to do this extra step. So now it's actually installing other stuff I'm using in GraphQL code gen, like define types for React Apollo, define types for um, GraphQL code gen itself. And what it has done now, it is installed those functions and now I'm able to run yarn generate again. And what it will do now, it will generate my TypeScript type. So with just this one command in 1.7 seconds, it actually created a graph, uh, TypeScript types based on my GraphQL schema. So if we would go to our code again, you can see there's a new folder called generated. And in here you can find all your uh, TypeScript types based on the schema. So as you can see, we've got a scholars mapping uh, we've got mutations in here. We've got a type for offer, which is, can also be found in our schema, and the one for product, which is actually the one we're querying. And something else I've done, um, I've defined documents. So what it has done now, it has also created React Apollo components for me. As you can look a bit more down. So I've defined a document somewhere in my .graphql file, and it actually created a document for it, and also created a component for it. So basically what I'm doing with this command, automatically creating uh, React Apollo components with GraphQL code generator. So this is gonna save me a lot of time actually defining types. Because if we go back to here, uh, you can see I have to find get products, I have to find the product type, I have to find everything, and then I'm using um, a query component from React Apollo to actually do this for me. But now I've done something way more clever, what I've done, I've created a new component with code generator. So something I could do now is the get products component, copy it here, and something I can do is just replace my existing query component because I no longer need it and everything's already been typed for me. As you can see, you can just replace those code. You can see you get some errors over here because TypeScript is maybe missing something because we also need to close the component. And then probably as of introspection, this can be deleted. 
And this can be deleted as well because my component is already fully typed. So I no longer need to define everywhere where I'm mapping something or maybe I'm doing a different function. I no longer need to define it again because of introspection. Okay, so let's get this out here as well. Oh, there isn't ID defined. Oh, let's get it out for now. Maybe it's not somewhere else to be fine. So we can just put in reseller here as the key. So basically now it should be all fine. And if I'm now we're in yarn start again, it would start my application based on the new component instead of the existing query component. As you can see, it's still getting my data. So something I can do now is just delete all those manually defined types because I'm not longer using them anymore. And I no longer have my query here because everything has been typed for me already. So as you can see, you can already delete a lot of boilerplate for my application. I no longer need GraphQL tag. I no longer need to react to Apollo. So maybe I can delete it from application as well. And this still works. And there are other things you can do as well because everything's got typed. And you can also choose to use React Apollo hooks in here instead of just query components. And just by saving this, you're going to save a lot of issues, a lot of bugs, and a lot of uh, possible like miscommunications with your other team members. So this really opens the door to end-to-end -end type safety, because you can imagine if you've got your GraphQL schema as a sort of proof, you can use it to uh, feed your UI applications, you can use it to feed other APIs, maybe you can even link your database to it, and if end-to-end uh, -end type safety in a complete, um, complete line that you're running as well. Because you can also automatically generate React components, but we also saw with the code generator, you can also create Angular components or Stencil components, and probably even more components if you're really looking for it. Because it also just generates the types for you. So you can just do whatever you want with those types and add them to other uh, libraries you're using as well. And like I said before, you can also use it server-side. So something I'm doing, I create GraphQL servers with TypeScript, and then it's also really convenient not having to rewrite those types every time. So one thing people start asking me, should I start converting everything to TypeScript? Because it uses types, it's safer, and especially when I'm using GraphQL, it's, something, it's a really way to go forward. But then I recently installed TypeScript to some um, old product I was running. You're going to run into all sorts of issues. So converting an existing project to TypeScript can be really hard. Uh, not really because TypeScript is hard, but mostly because all the other libraries you're using, uh, there should be types defined for those libraries. So if you're using old libraries or using libraries without type definition, it's really hard to convert those things to TypeScript. But especially when you work on a new project, and I've heard this from coworkers as well, if you're using JavaScript for a long time, you start using TypeScript, and you go back to JavaScript, you're really missing something. You get runtime errors and errors you wouldn't have expected if you're working with TypeScript. So, yeah, I think most importantly, what you need to know, definitely start using a type system, whether it's for your API with GraphQL or for your front end with something like TypeScript. It's really important to have things typed out because it saves you a lot of time, a lot of bugs, and also a lot of time writing unit tests for like unnecessarily small things like checking if a string is really a string. So I hope you learned something new from this talk. And yeah, if you want to get more information about this, just find me on social media or find something else on either of those websites. And yeah, enjoy the last talk of today and hopefully see you at the after party. Thank you. I think we lost our master of ceremony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, apparently I am. Uh, now I think you're going to start setting up. Thank you. That was the fastest 30 minutes in history. <laughs> I was sure that I had time to, you know, have a cigarette, go to the Wajenka and give him to Dom Nabasanu. Okay. So, did everyone ask questions already? Ha skipped questions? Why? Does anyone, any one question, anybody, anything? Yes? Thank goodness. Okay. One second. Uh, hello. Have you found any problems with this stack which you uh, uh, which you uh, proposed? Um, maybe if you find really uh, hard to read GraphQL schemas, but I haven't saw this before because it knows relationships 
And basically, like I showed you, most of the type definitions are really similar. OK, thank you. OK, maybe one quick ship because I see he's still, no? OK.